Bob and I have worked together for about 15 years um, in various areas around the St. Croix Valley. Um, Bob is what I would refer to as a cybersecurity evangelist. He's grown with the passion of cybersecurity and hacking um, ever since he entered the computer support field back in 2000. He's currently a certified information systems professional, big words. He's also a certified ethical hacker. Both of these things really mean Bob's a good guy. He's a white hat, so he, he's on our side. Um, as a senior security, senior cybersecurity engineer for computer information technologies, um, Bob leads a team that uh, helping clients realize their high levels of computer network website security. We contract him for vulnerability assessments, penetration testing, and cybersecurity awareness training. So that's what Bob is here to do for us tonight. Bob Weiss from Thank CIT. You. I am so glad that the weather stayed crappy because people came. You know, if it if it had been sunny, you'd all be mowing your lawn or grilling something or something. So, woohoo! Bad weather, yeah. So anyway, a little bit about me. Um, John already kind of filled in the blanks. Uh, the first thing you need to know is I collect alphabetical letters. You see all those letters. And I'm looking for Q and Z because they're really tough to get. And if you got them, you know, come see me after. We'll work out something. Okay. And um, the one thing that he didn't mention is I write a cybersecurity blog, which of course makes me a blogger, which is actually probably the most inelegant profession you can blog or something like something that happens after bad food, you know. But um, I write three articles a week for people like the people in the room. They're not overly technical. Basically, I'm keeping an eye out for interesting bad things that can happen to you. First, they have to be interesting, otherwise I'm bored. But, you know, interesting stuff that can happen to you and how to know if it's trying to happen to you and what to do about it if you let it happen to you, okay? And we're going to talk about some of those issues tonight. So, you know, some of this is going to be funny. A lot of it's going to be scary. It's really weird when you put those two feelings together, but that's the way my life works. So, anyway, off we go. Um... We're going to talk about something called fishing, and many of us know fishing as something you do in a boat on a body of water, and that's not the kind of fishing we're talking about, and no, I don't, I can spell. Um, the, the fishing with the PH is a hacker term for an email campaign that is designed to trick you into doing something that's not good for you, okay? These are going to be emails coming in your inbox that skip past your spam filtering and are very, in many cases, very realistic. And in some cases, may have been specifically created just for you or just for people in your group. People who share like a work environment or people who are in the same organization or what have you. Lots of times these things are getting personalized now. So the first thing you need to accept is that your inbox is a preferred point of attack. Why? Well, the good old days where you could hack your way in from the internet side using all that fancy keyboard stuff that we remember from Swordfish, that doesn't work anymore. There are good, good edge devices or devices at the edge of your personal network that prevent that from happening. And even the hum, humble Comcast cable modem or CenturyLink DSL modem has rudimentary firewalling technology that keeps people from hacking in like that. So in order to get into your computer business, they have to have you help them open the door, okay? So that's what the phishing email is designed to get you to open an attachment or click on a link. There's going to be some parts of the phishing email there's the story. There's some kind of a problem. There's always a problem. Or maybe it's some kind of an exciting opportunity, something really cool or free. I do fishing simulation tests for corporate clients as part of my work. And my best <coughs> email for tricking people is a free coupon for Starbucks. Okay? 
So I send out the coupon for Starbucks, I get 20% of the people to click on it and download it. If it was really a phishing email, I would have a way now at pro install the program that will let me remote into their computer and use it later on any way I see fit. Okay, now the funny thing about that coupon is that I ran it against one organization. The CEO was kind enough to share in the training that we had afterwards that he had fallen for it and printed out the coupon and taken it to Starbucks and they gave him coffee. <laughs> so my email trick twice. I was really happy with it. Never had that result. That was cool. So there's the story. There'll be a request, and the request is going to be you, you need to log in here and fix your, change your password, or you need to log in here and give us credit card information, something like that. There'll be a link to click on, or it will be open the attachment and read the document, and it'll tell you what to do. And there's always a penalty. The, the way that one of the ways that you can tell a phishing email is that there's always like a, if you don't do this, bad things will happen to you as part of the story. A real legitimate company does not threaten their customers for any reason. Unless, of course, they're trying to collect a debt, and that's a whole other story. But, you know, seriously, though, if you get an email from customer service from, say, First Bank, they're not going to end the email by saying, and if you don't help us out here, we're going to close your account. That just doesn't happen. But there's also a penalty in a phishing email. So as we said, there are basically two things that you're going to be asked to do, one or the other, occasionally both. One is clicking on a link. Clicking on a link will take you to a web page that was created to extend the scam, to extend the trickery. This is something we call a landing page. It's from advertising when you create a campaign. You create a landing page that you can only get to by clicking on the link in the email. In a legitimate advertising situation, that's what that's called. We call them landing pages because they work the same way. Usually the landing page will be a logon screen for some service you're used to working with, or it may have a web form that's going to ask for other types of information. Or you may get an attachment. Many times the attachment will be a PDF file, might be a Word document. Or it may come in a zip file. This is, looks like a little file folder with a zipper running into it. Zip files are kind of interesting because the contents have been compressed and a zip file can contain more than one thing at a time. And typically it includes some sort of a document like a PDF or Word file and also a program a piece of software that gets installed automatically and allows the attacker to further some exploit on your computer. Maybe a remote access thing to let them log in to your computer later and do other things. It may be a banking Trojan horse that will let them capture your banking user ID and password so they can go banking in your online banking. It may be one of the crypto ransomware type attacks where all your personal files are encrypted and then you're encouraged to spend $300 in Bitcoin. How many of us have a Bitcoin wallet? Anybody? Anybody here? I'm always the only one. So that's going to be your first problem is how do I pay this guy in Bitcoin? And, you know, that's not going to be your only problem. So one of the main goals is to hijack your computer credentials or your network credentials. This may be your email address credentials. It might be your banking credentials. It might just be your logon for your computer at work. So usernames and passwords have value. If I can get you, if I can trick you into sending me your username and password for your Amazon.com account, oh, what can't I buy? I mean, everything's for sale on Amazon, really big stuff like cars and one-click checkout and your credit card. As long as I don't exceed your credit limit, I'm like in, in high cotton. So the best way to get in is phishing emails. There's also a broader category called social engineering, and this can include things like telephone calls. There's a lot of fake tech support scams that are going around where you'll get a phone call from Microsoft 
And trust me when I tell you, nobody from Microsoft is going to call you ever for any reason, okay? So first, you know, your first clue is they don't sound like they're from around here. They're not saying, hey, you betcha. <laughs> And the second clue is, is nobody from Microsoft is ever going to call you, okay, ever. So think about this for a minute. If I can trick you into giving me your email address, username, and password, what I can do is I can just read your email. I can read your email that's coming in. I can read the mail that you've sent by reading it in your sent mail folder. I can look at your contact list and get to know who all your friends are maybe who your coworkers are or your, some of your customers or employees or whatever. I can look at your calendar. I can find out your travel schedule. I can learn about you on a very deep level. I will know things about you your own family members don't know. And then once I've made my research, I can use your email account as a platform for getting money. I can send if you, any part of your life involves sending invoices or collecting money, I can start doing that. And oh, by the way, we have a new bank. Here's the bank routing information. Please send your payment there. Or I can impersonate you in other ways that will further whatever my exploit is. And of course, hijacking your bank account, we don't have to imagine about this too much if you let somebody else into your you know, a cyber criminal in your bank account, they're just going to clean it out. There are special programs that have been written that do a wonderful job of helping them do this. Typically they come zipped up in an email attachment and these uh, programs keep track of what you're typing. So that's called a key logger, keeps track of what you're typing. If you happen to type, you know, a web address for a bank like www.mybank.com, it will actually send an alert message to the cyber criminal crew who will then remote into your computer, watch you bank, and then take over your session when you're done. So any kind of fancy two-factor authentication or matching the picture or whatever that the bank has set up, you've already logged in. And they just say, simply take over your session. So there's that kind of bad stuff can happen. Everybody looks so sad. You're all going, I wish it had gone sunny because I'd rather be cutting my grass than listening about this horrible stuff. <laughs> and the FBI has a special name for it when the target is the CEO of a company. This email account takeover thing is called business, uh, business email compromise by the FBI. It's become, in the last three years, three billion dollars have been extracted from US companies and this is how it works. I take over the CEO's email account, I wait for him to go on a business trip, and then I send an email to the CFO or the accountant or whoever and I say, I'm buying a company over here in China, I need you to wire 2.5 million dollars to me by the end of the day. 2.5 million dollars is not an amount of money I picked out of the air, that was a real case and they really lost two and a half million dollars. It's very popular with cyber criminals because as opposed to the crypto ransomware stuff where maybe I'm going to get $300 at a crack, this is like two and a half million, well, I'm not gonna to have to work for at least a month. <laughs> I think I can make that two and a half million stretch, you know, so, I've told you all the scary stuff. Now I'm going to give you some tools to unmask these imposters in your inbox. Okay? So here's a really nice diagram. It's got all kinds of boxes and arrows and they're too small to read. Lucky for you, I did this. So we're going to go back through this. But this is an email I got um, back in 2014. All of these emails are examples from my own inbox. I have a collection. You know, a lot of people collect stuff. I collect these kinds of emails. It's sad, I know. But it's very low cost. Because <laughs> I get all I need for free. And, and my, my delightful bride who's hiding behind the post over there is really happy that I have a cheap hobby. Because it might be golf, and we all know how expensive that is. But, but anyway, so this appeared to come from an attorney's firm called Green Winnick. 
And it says, to view a copy of the court notice, click here. Please read it thoroughly. If you do not attend the hearing, the judge may hear the case in your absence. When the judge hears the case in your absence, you generally lose the case, especially if it's just a lawsuit. So that's the threat. That's the, I've got a sad story. It's a really short story. And then I've got my call to action, which is click here, and then the threat. So there's the three parts of the, of the phishing email. Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the from address. And the, we notice it's from Green Winnick Lawyers. But then they're in these angle brackets, there's Lee Chow at ntuh.gov.tw. Now, that just doesn't look right. And I happen to know that TW is the country code for Taiwan. And Lee Chow certainly sounds like the name of a guy who might live in Taiwan and who works for the government at a branch that's initials are NTUH. So the National Transportation Universal Hot Sauce <laughs> Agency, whatever, right? So that's my first clue, is that the email address that's in the angle brackets does not make sense relative to who supposedly sent this. So what this means is that Lee Chow's email account has been hijacked, like we talked about, and it's being used to send out these types of emails. So let's take a look at the link here. What you may have not ever noticed is that if you take, when you come up on a link, the arrow turns into the finger. You know, you get that finger of the internet thing, right? And um, if you hover without clicking for about mm, five seconds, you get this little pop-up box appears and it's called a tooltip. And what's in there is the actual destination address that clicking on the link is going to take you, okay? What we see here is it's lilianarestrepo.info. Now this is not greenwinnick.com either. What's up with Liliana? Well, what Liliana doesn't know is that her website has been hijacked by this crew and they built a landing page for this exploit on her website. She doesn't know what's happening. She doesn't know she's part of a scam. And for all we know, that page may still be part of her website. It's not part of the navigation of the website. People who go to that website aren't going to find it. It's just a at the end of the link. The reason that criminals use other people's web servers for building their web pages is that they can't be traced back to them. All roads lead to total innocent strangers who had nothing to do with it. So I googled Green Winnick, and what I got was malware scam virus alert. The fourth one that didn't fit on the page was Green Winnick's actual real website. So the people in charge of their web marketing, I'm sure we're going crazy because, you know, we went from number one, now we're like last, you know, fourth. But this is enough to tell me that this is like a fake email. So what I'm recommending here is that lots of times you can answer these questions for yourself simply by Googling something relevant out of the email, either the subject line or the name of the company or what have you. And in fact, Google works really great for all the little mysterious message windows that pop up on your computer. Some of them are legitimate that are coming from the operating system and like, hey, help me, something's going wrong. And others of them are quite frankly fake. There are fake little pop-ups that happen because you unfortunately moused across an ad that was infected with this little pop-up gambit, okay? So, you know, my computer's infected, your computer's infected, please call this toll-free number. You can Google that up and you'll find out that there's nobody there that's going to help you either. It's the same Microsoft employees that don't sound like they're from here. So let's take a look at another one. Back in 2014, I was not brave enough to click on the links and go to the landing pages, but I've overcome my shyness. And anyway, I have a computer that if it gets screwed up, I just, I just reinstall everything. And, and so I don't care so much about this particular computer, which is not here to hear this sad thing I'm saying up to it, because otherwise they get funny. You know how it is. Um, so anyway, here we have something from US Bank Corp. 
Um, without blowing it up, I will tell you that the email address in the angle brackets is mail at nationalairviews.net. So this right away tells me this is not US Bank Corp at all. It's a scam. But let's move on. When I hover over Get Started, the link, I get fatcatscones.com. <laughs> now, Fat Cat Scones is a real place on the internet. I went there. They make yummy bakery treats like scones. They have nothing whatsoever to do with banking. And this is another sad story where Fat Cat Scones' website has been hijacked to be used in this particular exploit. This one's really recent. This one's from last November. Now, when we click on the link, we get this gorgeous US Bank login to your account screen. I guarantee you it looks exactly like the real thing. Up here, the teeny tiny type that those of you who are sitting in the back are going, darn, I could have had a front row seat. It says fatcatscones.com. So that's another thing that you can be looking for if you should click through is take a look up here to what's called the address box and see if the address matches what you would expect. I would expect to see usbank.com in that address window. And we're going to talk a little bit later about this free website called Virus Total. In the meanwhile, you're just going to have to be mystified and wait for me to explain it. But there's a way for me to check the web address on Virus Total to see if it's legitimate or not. And when I checked Fat Cat Scones, I got malicious site phishing site back, which is not a good day if you're running a bakery and you're wondering where all your web business went. The other thing that we mentioned just a minute ago is checking the web address. Now, because there's blabbermouths like me telling people how to avoid these kinds of problems, the people on the other side, the dark side of the web, have begun to register their own domain names that are like near miss or interestingly phrased web addresses so that they look like the real thing. I've written about a couple different things like this in my, in my blog. I'm not going to get technical because it's in the evening and people will fall asleep on me. So just take my word for it. There are at least three cool ways to register domain names that are really good looks likes. And I've got an example right here. This is an email from a guy named J.F. Palomino. J.F. Palomino is my evil twin. I am J.F. Palomino. And J.F. Palomino has a long history. When we were raising our son, and I couldn't use real swear words, this was my made-up swear word. It works great, by the way. If you hit your thumb with a hammer, you can go, J.F. Palomino, and it just feels right. <laughs> so that's J.F. Palomino. He has a LinkedIn profile, including a photograph, a photograph I got off of Google Images. I put in the search terms computer guy, and I got a bunch of images, and I picked a guy that looked like the most computer guy guy I know. Doesn't look like me, but, you know, he looks like all the nerdy guys I work with. So, you know, Jeff. So when we click on this link, this is an email I created, frankly, for one of our phishing, you know, our phishing simulation, you know, tests. But clicking on the link takes us to this page, which is a dead ringer. If any of you have used Office 365 online, this is a dead ringer login page. Why? Because I did something really technically hard when I created this page. I copied the code and pasted it in, and I got the exact same thing. So you don't have to be a super genius. All you have to know is how to do is copy and paste and a little bit of web design stuff in your, in your home. I did this whole exploit in less than an afternoon a couple, three hours. So you don't have to invest a lot of time and energy to be a super cyber criminal. You know, what can I say? But anyway, let's take a look at the web address. It's outlook.off.fis356.com. Now there's a couple things that are wrong with this. First thing is, is that this is the domain name I registered, fice356.com. That's my domain name, okay? The dot 
means I'm creating a subdomain. And so OF is a subdomain. And because I own the main domain, I can put anything I want to in front of this. So some of the things that they're doing is registering a generic sounding domain name like customers support desk dot net and then they'll put paypal dot customer support desk dot net and it'll look and then they can use it for amazon dot customer support that they can change it around and use the domain name over and over and over again okay this one's mine and it's just for office 365 so there's in addition to the dot the other thing that's wrong up there is it's 356 rather than 365 and you're, some of you are wondering, well, Bob, if you're such a smart guy, why didn't you register FICE365.com? And the reason is somebody else already had. Probably not a nice guy like me. So somewhere out there, there's an exploit just like this running around, you know, doing stuff. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit about the virus total file, uh, virus total scanning system. Virus total is a free web service that you can get to at virustotal.com. It is supported by Google and 50 of the top uh, security software vendors, people like McAfee and Symantec and Kaspersky and I mean, there's a lot of them, and a lot of them you won't even recognize the name because they're sold primarily in Europe or other, like Asia, other parts of the world. But this is a big consortium of people, and what they want us to do is send them our suspicious emails so that they can analyze them. What they're hoping is to find new ones that nobody's seen before, what they call zero-day attacks. You've heard the term, maybe. Zero days, right? And zero days, that's when your homework's due. Zero day. And no, I'm kidding. But um, so Virus Total exists to help anyone figure out if they're being scammed or not. So let's talk about how this works. Here we have the, the file scanner. So you can actually, if you wanted to, and I'm not recommending this, save off your attachment to your desktop and then upload it to, no, no, okay, we're just going to forward that email, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. But those web links, the ones that you get by hovering your finger, you can right click on that link, and there'll be a copy command. There'll be a copy hyperlink, or copy this link to my pay clipboard. It depends on what your browser you're using, but there'll be a copy command, and then you can simply paste it in the box here at example.com, and get it get an analysis like we've seen a couple of. So here's a FedEx standard overnight email. It has a zip attachment. I happen to know that this zip attachment contains a crypto locker type ransomware encryption ransomware uh, product. Why do I know that? Well, one of my customers was kind enough to unzip this so that I could investigate it thoroughly. They of course lost all their data. And because they never did that backup thing I recommended over and over again, we had no place to go for it. And they didn't want to spend 500 bucks to get it back. And so it was gone. But I did, I was able to recover the email that he uh, clicked. And I looked in my spam folder at home and found the same email. So I saved it because I collect these things, right? Because I have got this sad little hobby where I collect emails, right? And so if you get an email and you'd like me to collect it, you know, send it to me. But in any event, we can see from this that, first of all, FedEx Standard over, Overnight has Luis Holt at JuanLozanoCoach.com, and that just doesn't seem right for FedEx. It should be FedEx.com. And so, you know, here we have a couple of red arrows, one showing the bogus... Um, email address, another one showing the suspicious zip attachment. So what I am doing with this, rather than saving off the attachment and hoping it doesn't accidentally open up and infect my computer, is I'm just going to forward the email. I'm just going to click on forward, and I'm going to send it to scan at virustotal.com. I'm going to change the subject line to the word scan. So if it says, you know, free stuff, 
or your account's compromised, just erase that and type the word scan. And then you send it off to Virus Total. In about five minutes, you'll get a reply email that looks like this. And if it finds anything, you've got an infected email and that just needs to be deleted. Okay. Now you'll notice that some of these companies found nothing. That just means that that particular malware scanning tool hasn't seen this one yet. They don't, haven't developed the detection thing for it. So I basically assume if I get one positive response, that's enough for me. I'm done messing with that email and it goes into my collection. You will want to put it in your trash, but you know, unless of course you want to become goofy like me, in that case, see me later, okay? <laughs> After the questions. So, believe it or not, we're coming up on the end of this. There'll be plenty of time for questions here in a second. So, solutions. First thing I want to impress upon you is never click on a link in an email, at least not with doing the little hover trick. Okay, if the hover trick doesn't work, clicking on the right mouse button, not the left one. The left one means we're going there. Clicking on the right mouse button and choosing properties from the menu that pops up will get you the same information, the, web, the actual web address. Take a look at that address, make sure you want to get there. But more importantly, okay, so I got an email from US Bank. Well, first problem is, is I don't do any banking there, so for me it was like a no-brainer. Um, but let's say I did bank there. Well, I probably have like a shortcut on my browser bar, a favorite, that I click to when I do my online banking. Use that. That is never going to mislead you. That is never going to be spoofed or tricked or go to all the painful, exhausting work of actually typing the whole web address up in that address box. I know it's a pain in the neck. WWW, I type W so often that the prints wore off my key www.whatever.com, you know, whatever you're going to that time. You type it yourself or use a shortcut that you already have. Um, never open an attachment without verifying the contents. How do you do that? If somebody sends me an attachment, they get a phone call from me and saying, hey, I see you sent me an email. What's in the attachment? I have had at least five occasions and probably a few more than that where the people said, I never sent you an email. And now I'm done. Now I know I've got something for my collection. And I also tell the person, I said, I think your email account might have been hijacked because I got this email from your, you know, it's legitimately your email address. So you might want to change your password and maybe the, all the secret answers to those secret questions. Um, out of band verification, this is a fancy way of saying if they send you an email, Replying by email saying, hey, did this really come from you? Is no good if the bad guys have taken over this account. They're going to just send one back saying, yeah, of course. I sent it to you. Who else? What, do you think I got a bad guy living in my inbox? So you need to make the phone call or text message. You know, if you're doing that, I don't see a whole lot of feverish text messengers here in the room today. So, you know. Maybe not text, but you know, phone. We all remember how that works, right? You push all the buttons. Some of us remember when you used to like uh, spin a dial. Yeah, to make that phone call. Um, all requests for money or wire transfers, you need to confirm. This is more appropriate in a business environment, but it happens. Um, there are scammers out there, and this may not be an email scam, but it might be a phone call from Officer Chumley and your grandson has been arrested and we need, you know, thousands of dollars for his bail. You may want to confirm that at least three places because people don't always answer their phone or they're busy or whatever before you actually send out the money. Um, when in doubt, Call, it says call IT. Well, you know, who could you call? I do have some business cards up here. You could call me. I'd be happy to answer your, you know, been doing this for years. And, um, or 
if you have someone who is your go-to computer person, we all have a computer buddy somewhere, you know, when in doubt, check it out or Google it. And learn to trust your feelings. I have always been extremely paranoid, unusually paranoid, and there's at least one person in the room who can confirm this. I won't put her on the spot again, Sherry. And, um, but I, you know, okay, so we're going out to eat. I want to sit with my back against the wall facing the door so I can watch for, you know, lone, lone gunmen. If there ever is a lone gunman, I have no idea what's going to happen, but I will be watching for that person, okay? And um, when I finally got into cybersecurity, all that paranoia made sense, so I was able to stop taking the meds. <laughs> so anyway, what I'm saying here is learn to trust your own feelings. If things seem weird to you, they're weird. Okay, don't think that you, mm -hmm, and, you know one of the one of the my my favorite little phrases for avoiding doing stuff is I can't right now, I can't right now. So you get that phone call or whatever, somebody's pestering you for yeah, I can't right now, and and we're done. You didn't say no, you know, because we can't say no in Minnesota or Wisconsin. It's not polite, right? It's you know. So this is a good later. And then you can hang up the phone. I can't right now. And so that's it for me. Um, I'll put the tip jar out in a minute. No, I'm kidding. Um, and uh, thanks. I think somebody wants to, yes, you want to make a quick yeah. announcement? Um, so we'll do a Q&A, but um, you should each have a little, just a quarter sheet of paper. Um, just if you want to fill that out, we have two boxes of chocolate from Kenoki. That's kind of a thank you for coming. We won't send you junk email or, you know, links to click, click on, but yeah, you can just yeah. fill that out. Then Kathy will walk around and pick it up, and then we'll pick a couple winners. And then Bob will answer your question. So I saw somebody had a hand up, the blue, yes. Is any device safer than another device with your email list, which is Um. Yeah, I'm going to repeat the question because we've got, you know, video going here. Um, the question is, is, is one device safer than another for opening email? And the answer is not really. Um, and I know that Apple users are convinced that Apples are invulnerable. They're wrong. Um, Apple, what, what was true about the Apple platform is that for a long time it was ignored by cyber criminals because it was too small of a user group back when it was 3% of the market, now that it's 12, it's worth hunting. And Apple users generally are from a wealthier demographic. And what that means is you got more stuff, more crap I wanna take. So yeah, Apple, you know, and, and Android, sorry, you know. So you just have to, you know, take your chances. The good news is, is just opening and reading your email is generally not harmful. It's poking around, clicking on stuff. Yes, um, well, let's go back to the... Okay. Yeah, yeah. See, she, she went to my training class at the bank and, 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 and they liked it and so I'm here. Um, passwords. The short, simple answer on passwords is that all passwords are cracked using machines, unless, of course, we trick you into just sending it to me on a web page like that U.S. Bank web page. But, but when, when you hear about companies where they've stolen 40 million records and cracked the passwords, that's all done with machines. And the only thing that makes a difference against machine cracking is the length of your password. It needs to be longer. At right now, 12 characters is the minimum length you want to go. Um, all the other stuff, changing it frequently and making it all mixed up, jumble of letters and numbers and all that other stuff just doesn't matter when machines are doing the work because the bad guys just turn them on and let them grind the list to, to dust and they don't care. The machine's doing the work. Um, and then the, the second answer is two-factor authentication. This is going to be the coming thing. And for places like Facebook, 
and Amazon and your Google accounts, if you have a Gmail account and other major accounts, will have, you'll have the opportunity to get a one-time passcode either sent to you by text message or on a little phone app or whatever. When you combine longer passwords with two-factor authentication, it's really, really hard to, to, to hack your account because even if they get your password, they'll never get that six-digit code unless they have your phone. Okay. You know, that's interesting. We were doing about cars when we were over in uh, Europe. They have one to that, too. They yeah. didn't let my husband in until I had a code. Yep. Because, well, and it was perfectly fine, but I mean, it's interesting that they are that careful. Yep. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. How do you get to be a certified ethical hacker? How do you get to be a certified ethical hacker? Well, I will tell you, it, first thing is to answer the unasked question, because you're very polite, is that, yes, it's as bad as it sounds. I got trained to do all the things that bad guys do, and I, I could. So if we have an, another really bad recession and my IRA takes a third hit, well, I got... I got uh, I got options, and it may it may involve moving to Brazil so that I don't have to worry about extradition. But you know, for the rest of you, you know. But no, what certified ethical hacker? I took a course of study. Took me about a year and a half to do the the studying part, and then I had to pass a fairly rigorous certification exam, um, and then they sent me a really nice piece of paper to hang on the wall and a little pin to put in my collar or hat and 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 a secret decoder ring you know I mean but but what I got of course were some really cool skills that allow me to replicate or analyze or try and figure out what you know for me half the fun is trying to figure out what they're trying to accomplish Thank you again for coming. On behalf of First State Bank and Trust and our insurance subsidiary value agencies, we really appreciate your being here. Thanks again to Bob, and we hope you found the evening helpful and informative. It was a little bit scary, but I think there was a lot of good information there. Thank so you. thank you very much. Thank you.